Millions of people here. Millions and millions. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Hi. Welcome to Answers News for October the 11th, 2021. I'm here with Ken Ham. I'm Georgia Prodom. This is Tim Chafee. We're your panel for today. We have a wonderful studio audience joining with us. So make yourselves known again. Let's hear it. Come on. You can do better than that. So we always start off by uh, just giving you a couple of announcements as people are starting to get online. Yep. Uh, so we will give announcements about our Explore Days and High School Labs. Georgia, yeah. you want to do so that? So our Explore Days and our Explore Junior program is um, targeted for the um, elementary as well as high school age children. So junior is for kindergarten through fifth. Explore Days are for sixth through twelfth grade. And we do them on a variety of topics here at the Creation Museum as well as some at the Ark Encounter on things like zoology, paleontology, dinosaurs, botany, astronomy, uh, all kinds of really fun topics. So for junior, it's a half day. For explore days, it's a full day. Uh, and professionally instructed, uh, lots of great workshops and sessions for kids. So check out, go to the Creation Museum website, click on Education tab at the top, and you'll find out how to register for those events. And we also have coming up next year, for the first time ever, our first ever high school lab intensive. So these are for uh, homeschool high school students. They will be held at our brand new lab at the Ark Encounter. So it is a state-of-the-art lab um, getting completed right now, and we're really excited to be in that uh, next year for a biology lab intensive and a chemistry lab intensive. So there'll be different weeks, and if you come as a high school student, you'll get all those essential labs that you need in one week. So it's a lot of labs um, <laughs> in, in, a, in a week, but lots of good times too with that. It'll be a lot of fun. And so if you want to register for that, um, you can go to, uh, again, go to the Creation Museum website, click on the Education tab, and it will talk about the labs there, and you can register for that. Highly recommend those. Those are great and a lot of fun. And there are some parents who will take their kids even out of a Christian school or public school mm -hmm. and bring them for those as well. Yeah, those are in the summer, so you wouldn't even have to take them out of school for that. You could just bring them. <laughs> so there so we are. So right. not just for homeschools. Right. So we always start off with one, what do we call it, fluff stuff? Well, fluff and stuff, fun articles. you got to have some of that. The news is way too serious. So, all right, squirrel hit 175 pounds of nuts in a Chevy Avalanche pickup while the owner was away. <laughs> I These saw, are <laughs> black walnuts. Yeah, I saw this one the other night as I was going to bed, and I thought, i got to send that to Harry. we got to get this on the, on the program. <laughs> <laughs> Can you imagine coming home to that, Try to oh. start your truck up? And in the engine bay. Yeah. Not in the bed of the truck, all right, in the engine bay. And the, the guy even said that some of them, um, he got as many out as he could, and you can see the buckets of them there, but some of them are actually in the frame, and he can't get to them. Ugh. Well, i got a story to tell about that. Oh, no. My wife and I went to Australia one year to visit family. We were over there for like three weeks mm -hmm. and came back. And then for the next week, she told me every time she drove her car, it was squeaking. There was a little squeak coming out of the front. I thought, that's weird. Anyway, then, uh, after about a week, she said, the squeak stopped. And it was after she turned the fan on in the car. Oh, no. And the squeak stopped. <laughs> I thought, that's strange. And it wasn't long after that, she said, my car is starting to smell. Oh. And what we found out was, well, we, end up, we had to take it to Toyota. And they had to dismantle the whole air system and all that because we'd left the vent open. You know, they automatic these days, you know, hit press a button and they open and close. Left the vent open and a mouse had got oh. in there and built a nest and had babies. <laughs> so then we figured out what the squeak was. And then we figured out why the fan stopped the squeak. <laughs> and then and why and then why it started to why smell. It smelled, yeah. Fun. And then let me, let me ask you a question, Tim. How long do you think it takes to get the dead, to smell of a dead mouse out of your air conditioning system it's, in your car? Yeah, a couple of months. That's tough to reach. A couple of years. I <laughs> Never. That thing we bought, I think we bought all the, the different things you can get. To, I think if you would have just lined the vents with Vegemite, that would have taken care oh. of it. <laughs> I think we went down the supermarket and the auto pasta and we, every fragrant thing you could buy, we're putting in that thing. 
Anyway, that was our story about we, yeah. we now, if we leave the car for a prolonged period, you turn the vent off and make yeah, sure it's Yeah, it's probably off. a good plan. So my wife does it every time she goes in the garage now. She's paranoid. <laughs> yeah, I don't know if they can see the picture. Four of those five-gallon buckets full of black walnuts. Those things, they're big. Uh, if you've had those in your yard before, we used to have a bunch of them. Um, be careful if you're using a riding lawnmower over the top. They'll shoot them right out, so make sure you don't have people off to the side. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. So, All right. Oh. We did have uh, someone on here from uh, Switzerland. Who are that? I have somebody from uh, Queensland. Australia. So, good day. Yeah. Yep. Good day. All right. Fox News host Ainsley Earnhardt launches series Beyond and Back to show proof of heaven. All right. So this is to, I think, kind of in celebration of the 25-year anniversary of Fox. And um, Ainsley is a professing Christian. And we always need more Christians in the news. <laughs> that would actually be a good thing um, in news broadcasting. But um, the show, Proof of Heaven, is basically to show the uh, stories of several people that claim to have, quote unquote, died and either went to heaven or hell in some cases and come back to then talk about it. You know, you know before we sort of comment on this article too much, there's two verses of scripture I want to put up. One is Acts 17, 11. Uh, now, these Jews were more noble than those in Thessalonica. They received the word with all eagerness, examining the scriptures daily to see if these things were so. The Bereans. Yep. The Bereans. That's who I was talking about. The Bereans who examined the scriptures daily. And then in First Thessalonians, but test everything. Hold fast what is good, but test everything. And I think, you know, one of the emphases I see a lot today is people going on the basis of their feelings. And we need to understand, we've got to judge our feelings against God's word. In fact, because the heart of man is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked, can we really trust our feelings? The answer is no. But we need to judge what we believe against the authority of the word of God. So that's the first thing I would say. There's a principle there that seems to be missing from the article. Yeah. Yeah, and there's, uh, you know, Ainsley has done Bible studies on the air. I mean, she's somebody who definitely is concerned about seeing people come to the Lord. She even shares the gospel in, the, in this yeah. article. Um, 2 Corinthians 12, Paul talks about how he knew a man, and he's probably talking about himself, um, who went to, was taken up to the third heaven, and he saw things that were inexpressible, things that he wasn't allowed to write about. And so I always question when we hear people who say they've gone to heaven and they write a book about it, or they've gone to hell, they write a book about it. Because if, if the Apostle Paul, who wrote 13 books of the New Testament, wasn't allowed to write about it, it it makes me wonder if, you know, why are people today allowed to write about it? It's not that we need new revelation because God has given us what we need in Scripture. Uh, the one thing I would do is just make a distinction between what we could call like heavenly, heaven tourism <laughs> articles or books from what's called a near-death experience. Uh, there are a lot of people who have testified to having these and other people who have documented them, you know, doctors in the room where the person was clinically dead. And they when they came back, they knew things that they should not have been able to know. They knew the conversations that were taking place in the room. They knew conversations that were taking place down the hallway. And there's, from a physical perspective, there's no way they should have been able to know those things. And so there are a lot of cases like that. We have an article on our website uh, that Brandon Clay wrote talking about near-death experiences, does a good job with that. We've got another one by John MacArthur from the magazine where he talked about the heaven tourism video. So we've got two different articles dealing with both aspects of that. And, yeah, and I think I think one of the things that kept I kept thinking as I was reading this article is, is she talks about these experiences and how they're so important in helping people have faith in the afterlife, that the afterlife exists. And I'm like, well, we have the Bible. <laughs> um, that's the inerrant, infallible word of God. And it tells us that when we die, we will go to one of two places, right? Heaven or hell, uh, depending on if we have received Christ as our Savior or not. We don't need someone's experience to help us have assurance of that. Um, we, we have God's word, and so it is sufficient, right? We don't need things outside of it to help us know that it's true. Uh, so that was one thing that I think really struck me as I, kept, as I read it. Well, I think a good example from Scripture would be Luke 18, I think it is, isn't it? The rich man and Lazarus. Yes. And whether it's uh, an, an account of real people, was it Luke 18? Uh, 16, 16, I think. Yeah. 16, 16. Yeah. Whether it's um, a parable or you know, a real events that occurred. Yeah, if it's a parable, it's the only one where you actually named somebody. I know, and that's the, that's the reason why, you know, many people believe it was, there were real people. Mm -hmm. right. And uh, the rich man dies and goes separated from God and, mm -hmm. um, and Lazarus to uh, heaven with the Lord. And the rich man wanted to come back and warn his five brothers. Mm -hmm. And uh, he said, uh, 
but they have um, Moses, they have and, Moses the prophets. and the prophets. Yeah. You know, yeah. that's what they're up, what Abraham said. You know, he said to Abraham, "I got five brothers. Want to go back and warn them?" But they have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. Nay, Father Abraham. But if one rose from the dead, they'll repent. Remember what he said. Yeah. Even if one rose from the dead, which of course he was talking about uh, what he's about to do, they're yeah. not going to believe. Yeah. Uh, and so, and that's what happened, by the way. Jesus did rise from the dead, and yeah. they spread all sorts of false rumors to try and. Explained it away. Yeah, no, some some did believe, obviously, but yeah, yeah, there's still a lot. It just comes down to the heart issue. It's not really a matter of the evidence. It's I, whether they truly want to believe in the Lord or not. And, um, yeah, I met, I met a man once who was an atheist, and he said to me, "I don't care if they find a big boat on the top of Mount Ararat. You can drag it down the main street. I'm not going to believe in the, yeah. you know the Noah's flood and Noah's ark." So we got to remember they're willingly ignorant. It isn't what it says in Second Peter three yep. too when they deny creation, deny the flood deny coming judgment, said, for this they are willingly ignorant. So it's a choice on their part not to believe. So, yeah. so And a lot you, of times, too, these accounts are, are, if you compare them to Scripture and what Scripture tells us about heaven, they're very different, right? And so that's another key. Like, we, like the verse that Ken shared about testing it against Scripture, it doesn't hold up, and so that's a problem. I'm trying to find the comments on my Facebook here, and it's not working. Well, if you, I don't know. I found if you click on it. Click so, on the common area. Yeah, well, I tried that too. Something, something weird going something on with, weird going with on. Facebook. Okay. Researchers explore what drives animal infanticide. So this is about the um, Langur males um, and females, obviously, uh, talking about these types of sort of, I don't know, are they monkeys? I forgot to look that up. Anyways, they're Langurs. And um, they will sometimes, depending on the situation, they found that when certain males entered a colony, that the young, the offspring of some of these uh, females started dying, okay, and or getting like wounds and things. So they were like trying to figure out why does this happen under certain circumstances. Um, and so one of the things that they've supposedly identified is a group of neurons in the brain, uh, specifically in the hypothalamus of the brain, that seem to um, trigger this aggressive behavior against what they're calling infants. Now, these are not human infants, obviously. Um, these are animal infants, but um, that may be responsible for this type of aggressive behavior. You know what gets me? This is an article about how um, you know, that shocked these scientists were and how horrible it is uh, to see uh, animals killing their, their own young uh, and, and for that happening and, and the way they're doing it and so on, it's hostile behavior and they, they're talking about how terrible this is. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Don't the majority of these people also support tearing up children in their mother's wombs and killing them by abortion? And yet that's okay. Yeah. But as soon as it comes to animals, oh, this is horrible. These animals are killing are killing the... Because we need to look at all of the behaviors that animals have, then that justifies a lot of very simple wrong behaviors in humans. And not only that, we're not animals. We're, right. we're very different, so we're making right. God's image, they're not. So the, the, it's a fallacious argument in the first place, but George is right. Unless you go to the Cincinnati Zoo, because they have a sign there when you go to the ape exhibit that you're visiting your family. Oh. It might be your family, but it's I not was, mine. I was going to say, well, it said yours, <laughs> that you're the one that saw it, but... <laughs> yeah, and... So these are monkeys. I did double check that. I was right on that. Um, and so, you know, from a from an animal perspective, these might be there might be certain neurons in the brain. They live. We live in a fallen world now, and so animals were changed as a result of the fall. And maybe as time has went on, there are some of these neurons that you know, um, perp, you know, that have this behavior or promote this type of behavior. But it's something that's happened in a fallen world, right? It's not originally how they were designed or created. Um, it's something that's happened since then. And it's totally different than human beings who aren't just controlled by, you know, certain anatomical, physiological, genetic things. We have a free will and we have a right to make choices. They, they call it abusive behavior toward infants. Yeah. Abusive behavior. Well, it is. Think of what humans are doing. Yeah. yeah. You know, and think of the fact that many of our leading politicians, I know we don't get, don't get into politics, <laughs> except when it's to do with moral issues and so on. But you think about Pelosi and Joe Biden and Kamala Harris, they want as many women as possible to kill as many children in the womb as possible, yep. right? And yet here's an article talking about animals killing their young. That's so abusive behavior. And I'm not trying to 
be, I'm not trying to be funny with this, but in a sense, he said it's abusive behavior. The article says it, but in a sense, it would be humane behavior, right? Because that's what humans are doing, and they're justifying it. Right. 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 So. Um, you know, I always look for other things in these articles. There's a whole paragraph here about why do we do what we do, and it goes on talking about we're trying to figure out how the brain works, and we can't figure this out, and it's so complex, and they can't figure it out. Well, and then on the other side of things, I'll say it all happened by chance, random processes, you know? Yeah. Um, well, so and I think, too, you've got to be careful. You don't want to try to... There are people that want to try to justify human behavior by saying, well, it's just genetic. You know, they couldn't help themselves, right, that they did these things, and they want to try to take away even human free will. And so no one's really guilty. They're just, you know, doing whatever their genes tell them to do. And so we have to be really careful with articles. And, and that is consistent with a naturalistic yeah. evolutionary worldview. It is, you, yeah. You wouldn't have a, a will. It's just a result of the chemicals, and you have to do what you do. And, yeah. and as you sort of said, I think you alluded to earlier, Georgia, when people are talking about, you know, what's abuse and what's right and what's wrong, how do they decide? Mm -hmm. Well, maybe a new team will mention that. Because if you have no absolute basis... Who decides what morality is correct? Right. And, yeah, and why, like you were talking about, why is it wrong if animals were to do this, but it's okay with humans? And, and what it comes down to is you'll see a lot of times people who, who love animals. It's great to love animals. We should. And we have people who work here, at the, you know, a lot of people who work at our zoo that care for animals and do a great job with it. But a lot of people have gone beyond that. They do what Romans 1 talks about, where they worship and serve the creature rather than the creator. They, they place the value of animals far above the value of humankind, and yet humans are the ones who are made in God's image. Yeah, and you think, think of the uh, animal rights activists, you know, who say you shouldn't eat animals because we're related to them. Yeah. And yet, at the same time, evolutionists believe we're related to plants. So they shouldn't eat plants either, right? <laughs> Then we're in Which trouble. would solve the problem? No. Well, if they led by example, that would yeah, that would solve the problem. <laughs> yeah. If if they if they didn't need any of their relatives. <laughs> okay, moving on. Some True. people got that. They understood. I, this I is a bright. Have. This I is a bright have. audience. Yeah, it really it's is. Good thing. It's a good. Thing. All right, transgender weightlifter Laurel Hubbard named Sportswoman of the Year. Okay, so we talked about this man. All right, this is a man who is pretending to be a woman. Um, a while ago when um, he was in the Olympics because he was competing alongside women, and that really wasn't fair um, at all. But anyways, he didn't actually end up qualifying because of something that happened. And so, uh, so, but nonetheless, he's been named the Sportswoman of the Year. And I found it kind of ironic. They said, Hubbard was reportedly the first transgender winner of the award during the event's more than 100-year history. Well, no, duh, because he's a he, not a she. Right? And previously, uh, they've only given it. Previously, they've only given it to women. Right. Yeah. Imagine that. Yeah. Now this isn't. This isn't like some worldwide recognition award. This is just the University of Otago in southern New Zealand. Um, can is that your favorite country? New Zealand. No, <laughs> Australians don't like New Zealanders. <laughs> I know. No. That's, I was I setting up. My, my good friend Ray, Ray Comfort. Who's heard of Ray Comfort from Living Waters? A number of you. Yeah, he comes from New Zealand. So he's one there's of always the... that rivalry between me, me and him. Yeah. <laughs> you know. So, uh, yeah, so it wasn't an international award, but just wait. It'll probably get, like, the most courageous by the ESPYs or something next year. I mean, ESPN will do something to be yep. woke and make sure they include them. You know, this world is going nuts. Once you abandon God's word, once you abandon God, it goes nuts. It's just the foolishness. Like, just recently, there was this article saying, can men get pregnant? And the answer was yes. And they were demanding people say men can get pregnant because it's a woman who thinks she's a man and uh, because a woman thinks she's a man, she, she wants people to know that men can get pregnant. You've got to be prepared to say that. And they're even insisting they say that in hospitals and so on, right? And then uh, there was a woman recently who said she was a man in hospital, and they wanted to give her a pregnancy test before they did an operation. And she said, I'm a man, and, and claim, now she's suing for discrimination or he, because they wanted to give a pregnancy test. And yet on the other hand... They want to say that men can get... The whole thing is stupid. People are nuts. It is. It, well, it, and even what was amazing to me was there was a guidebook that was um, put together by an LGBT activist organization that was given, that was approved by the International Weightlifting Federation. And in it, the booklet told reporters to ignore information that transgender athletes have an unfair advantage. That's not misinformation. That's fact. Right? Because there are certain things that these people are, you know, they, they, as they go through puberty, right, men develop 
bigger hearts, bigger lungs, bigger muscles. You, the, you can't change that. I don't care what your level of testosterone is in the future. That can't be changed. You, they are physically um, better to be able to do these things. And so, it just it, again, it amazes me. You talk about anti-science. This is anti-science. Yeah, if I challenge you to a test, you haven't got a hope. <laughs> I, I probably will not win. I, he's kind of getting up there in age. I know, he, he is getting to. up there. He's got a <laughs> birthday coming up. <laughs> Yeah, we celebrated that over the weekend. Mm. Uh -huh. So we've got, a, we've got a comment here on our yeah, YouTube um, page. Somebody said they saw in Answers Magazine about how scrub wallabies, uh, quokkas, uh, mm -hmm. will throw, oh. their, throw their joeys at predators, you know, the, the, the moms will, to try to get away. So that relates to the other, the infanticide oh, one. Okay. <laughs> so we've got somebody reading our magazine, which, by the way, we've got a great magazine called yeah. Answers Magazine. By yeah. the way, just so you know, I'm researching right now because I think my mother got my birth certificate mixed up in hospital. I don't think so. <laughs> tell them tell how old you are, Ken. Uh, 68 plus something. We don't, we don't have enough fingers and toes up here to, to get to that number. So. 68 plus two. <laughs> See, I, my mother got it all wrong. Yeah, yeah. All right. <laughs> These giant birds could eviscerate you. People were raising them 18,000 years ago. So... This is talking about Australia's largest bird, the cassowary, and no surprise because everything from Australia, pretty much like every animal wants to kill you or harm you or hurt you in some way. Um, and well, okay, so, hey, look at this. This, yeah, this is from one of our favorite parks in Australia where they have cassowaries. Look, they look so beautiful. It's, they're behind a pretty heavy fence because they, they advise Same. you not going anywhere near. No, they're not bigger than emus. The, the article says the biggest bird in Australia, but emus are bigger. I looked that up. Okay. Um, so, but you're just, well, yeah, the article well, you can't says always believe what you read in the media. No, that's exactly right. So, <laughs> everyone knows. Well, Most they of have time, very big claws. Yes, they do. On their feet, and that's where they can get you. Okay, that's how they they basically one swipe of that, and it will yeah eviscerate you. So. That's the problem. So basically, this whole study was studying these eggshells of cassowaries from like, you know, eggs, obviously, like 18,000 years ago in New Guinea and saying that it's possible the people of New Guinea collected the eggs, um, possibly hatched the cassowaries um, and raised them, possibly ate the eggs themselves, you know, like, you know, some sort of like a chicken egg, almost, almost like raising them like chickens. But it's really based on absolutely no evidence whatsoever to indicate that. Yeah, it's just the remains of ancient eggshells that have been crushed or broken. And They um, found crushed eggshells and immediately assume the people were raising the cassowaries, yeah, so I, I, eating I, them, and also getting them for eggs because I, they found crushed eggshells. I watched a video on these things before, and the, the males, um, as often is the case with, with birds, well, the female is bigger. So the male is the one that actually guards the nest. And if a, a female, a different female will come, it'll come along and crush the eggs. The, man just, the male just takes off running. It's like, come on, you got to man up. What are you doing? But so, it's crazy. And it's just sad so the female it. comes and crushes the eggs. Yeah. And then many, many, many years later, scientists, scientists come and find crushed eggs. And they reconstruct this whole scenario where the people that lived there uh, raised these birds for their eggs and for their meat Could because be. they found crushed eggshells. Yeah, the one thing I liked about this article is that usually when they talk about you know, humans from 18,000 years ago or beyond that, which there wasn't that many years, but um, they'll talk about how they're very primitive, how they didn't know much. So at least in this case, they're showing them to be intelligent, that they would be able to do a lot of these things that we would think with animal husbandry. Or, yeah, they, you know. they said they had very sophisticated knowledge. Yeah. So we agree. And I mean, I think, too, it's that whole idea of people that they said the importance of local and indigenous knowledge. Well, these people needed these skills and these traits to survive. And, you know, so what if they didn't know how to run a computer or do something like that? I can't survive in the outback. So, I mean, they've got the knowledge they need to survive where they are. And that's a good thing. Maybe it maybe it was about taking care of cassowaries. I don't know. But not much evidence. You know, when I went to school in Australia, I remember them saying, why does it have a crest on its head? And one of the theories that was in our textbook was it puts its head down to run through the rainforest to knock the plants out of the way. Oh, interesting. Probably when it runs, it does that anyway, just because it does that. You had textbooks back then. What's that? You had <laughs> Oh, that was good. Hey, thank, I thank, like that. Thank you, Tim. <laughs> Remember, he could, you know, oh, that's true. fire either one. Do you know how, yeah, do you know how tall, Tim, <laughs> you know how tall Tim is? How tall are you? 6'8". Six, 6'8". Eight. 
six eight when he stands up, he raises up there. So do you know what I call him? Nephiltim. Oh my gosh. Read Genesis six. We want to find out why that is. I didn't think he was going to be able to hear my comment, but. <laughs> oh, believe me, my ears are good. So, okay. hey, hey, you know what they call this looking after cassowaries that they didn't have evidence for that they think could have happened, might have? Ancient cassowary husbandry. Yeah. There you are. Yeah. It might have happened. Who knows? Might have happened. Wasn't that interesting to talk about something that might have happened and we don't know? <laughs> I mean, you, just think of the knowledge you now have. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Canadian Christian activists on trial for alleged hate crime at a 2016 Pride Parade. So this um, is about Bill Watt. Watcott, um, and in Canada, obviously, in Toronto, and uh, he, he and several others were distributing flyers during a Pride Toronto Gay Pride Parade, and talking about some of the physical as well as spiritual dangers of homosexuality, and he's being prosecuted under the willful promotion of hatred. Yeah, one of the things that we have been saying for a long time, actually, is some of these laws they're trying to bring in that they say, uh, oh, we're just trying to, to, to stop, you know, uh, violence and severe hatred and so on. But, but people have been saying all along, they're, they're just going to open a door and then they'll use it against Christians and then they'll just claim, who defines what hate speech is? I mean, you just put a general term, hate speech. Here, here's, here's how it's defined in the law for Canada. Everyone who, by communicating statements other than in private conversation, willfully promotes hatred against any identifiable group is guilty of an indictable offense, which is the same as a felony here, or similar to a felony, and is liable to imprisonment for a term not exceeding two years. So he might get 18 months uh, because he handed out pamphlets that were deemed hateful, but an identifiable group, Christians are an identifiable group, so if they say things that are against Christians, can, will they be prosecuted? Of course not. That won't happen. Well, you know, the interesting thing, the, some of the stuff that gets on social media against us mm -hmm. and some of the stuff gets on my personal social media against me and the way, that, the hatred that's out there uh, by some of these atheists and others and, this, and the way in which they use sexually perverted memes, all sorts of horrible things, and that's okay. But yeah, if, they don't get if, blocked, they don't get banned. No, yeah. but if you some, say something like, well, the Bible says there's only two right. genders, male and female, and homosexuality is a sin, that's suddenly hateful. that's hate speech. Right. And it is a loving thing to do. It's not a hateful thing to do because we're concerned about these people, right? We want them to know Jesus Christ as their Savior. We want them to stop living in that sin. So it's just it literally is the polar opposite of hate, it's loving, but again, anything that goes against the ideas that are pop, you know, popularly um, promoted in our culture today, it's hate. You can't just even disagree with someone. If you disagree with them, you hate them. But it is a reminder for all of us. I mean, I don't know how he did this or anything, but you know, First Peter three fifteen, you know, to give, be ready to give reasons, give answers for what you believe, but with gentleness, gentleness and respect. meekness, respect. And so we need to make sure we do that as Christians. Yeah, but Paul even, even about, doing it like that, they'll still accuse yeah, you of Yeah, Paul talks about speaking the truth in love. I mean, it is possible to say something that is loving and to do it in the wrong way. I mean, you have to have the right actions and the right words. And so we've got to be careful to do that. Um, it means being tactful uh, because the goal is to get people to respond appropriately, to listen to them. And if, you're just, if your actions are, are hateful, well, how, how many times are we going to respond well to that? So even if you're saying the right things, we've got to speak the truth in love. Yeah. There's something else in this article that I think is worth mentioning. They said that he initially wanted a jury trial, but his lawyer uh, suggested a judge-only trial might be better, warning that the jury composition in a notoriously liberal city like Toronto is likely to hold a bias against conservative values. And one of the things I've even heard from certain attorneys, uh, even in recent times, is one of the problems with jury trials uh, more and more is that people who get on there, if they're uh, extremely pro, say pro-gay and anti-Christian, uh, you've got to be careful the way they're going to vote. Because, you know, it's, it's just the same as when we hear uh, politicians saying, uh, you shouldn't have those people on the Supreme Court because they want liberals on the Supreme Court, not conservatives. What's it all about? They want people with a worldview that suits them, not a worldview. Uh, that would be more of a Christianized morality. And, yeah. right. and so it's all to do with worldview. It's, that, that's what it's all about. It's always been about that, yeah. really. Yep. Yep. 
All right, top trans doctor blow, doctors blow the whistle on sloppy care. Okay, so we're not going to talk about everything that's in this article because it's pretty graphic in places, but it is interesting because these two doctors who are transgender themselves and who um, do a lot in transgender medicine are saying, whoa, <laughs> there are things that we are doing to individuals, especially to children, like things like puberty blockers and cross-sex hormones that we really probably should not be doing. Now, you know, we've heard this from many other doctors, but when you hear it from people who are actually transgender and are, you know, trying to supposedly help transgender people, it's, it makes you pause and say, whoa, if they're saying that, then yeah, there really must be something wrong. Yeah, because they used to adopt a wait and see approach. You know, if a child was expressing these things, you know, you have a little boy who has a bunch of sisters and says, I want to be a girl, you know, something like that. But then they well, let's just wait and see what's going on here. And what, 70% of the time? 70% of the time. That there, there's no issue like that as they, as they grow up. Right. But um, now, if in the last eight to 10 years or so, there's been such a dramatic shift to instantly trust the kid no matter what, do not question it, and if any parents question it, I mean, there are cases where the kids are being taken away from their parents because of things like this, and um, it, it's insane. Well, well Gallupol just recently came out, and they did a survey of those who identify, say, as LGBT, and those over the age of 74, it was 1.4%. And then they go down through uh, the silent generation, then the baby boomers, Generation X, and they get to uh, millennials and Generation Z. And Generation Z, it's 16%. And so something has happened. It's not genetic. It's not biological. Right. It has to be an indoctrination. Well, and it, even they talk about the rapid onset gender dysphoria, which especially affects a lot of girls. Um, and it's, it's this peer pressure. It's this pressure to you know, do what everyone else is doing and be cool and rather than something that the child really wants. I mean, you know, when I read things like this, I think you know, we don't let, one of the things I brought up in the article was children don't know what's best. Duh. I mean, we don't let them decide their bedtime. We don't let them decide who the next leader of the United States is going to be. We don't let them drive a car because they, they're not old enough to do those things. They're not mature enough to do those things. But yet, We'll let them decide what gender they need. They should be. That doesn't make any sense, right? And so that's where parents are supposed to be advocates for their own children and helping them in these things. Instead, many of them are affirming this. And what it really shows is this is not about helping these children with what's best. It's an about a, an agenda. Yeah, and so right? it was refreshing to see two people who are clearly in this movement who have undergone those surgeries themselves say, whoa, pump the brakes a little bit here, rather than just full-on agenda, let's see if this is even best for, for these people. That, that's a bit refreshing. We don't usually get to hear that. Did you see, there was an article, in fact, I'll have it on my Facebook either tonight or tomorrow morning, posting it about Kamala Harris, the vice president, and she went and did this program for kids, oh, wow. and then she had this big statement in there, don't let anybody tell you what you uh, are or who you are. You decide for yourself who you are, don't. I mean, here so, she is so basically saying. So she's telling them what they are and what? Yeah, well, <laughs> by doing that, she's, she's, not, she's telling them what to think. Yeah. Right. And she is then saying she has a right to do that, not their parents. Right. I mean, right. think of what's going on in this yeah. culture. Um, just one uh, thing here, one product that we wanted to mention was the Gender and Marriage War. This is one of our brand new books that really talks about a lot of these topics like transgender, homosexuality that we've been discussing today. Gives you some really great um, answers to those particular questions that are being asked. Biblical answers, again, looking at the science and how that confirms and supports what the Bible says. So really encourage you to get this book. It's very, very helpful um, for answering those really difficult questions in the world that we live in today. I might just add that our speakers, writers, all got together yeah. and put in, you know, covered every topic that we could in, right. uh, in regard to this particular issue. So it's a very comprehensive book and yeah. uh, non-controversial. Not controversy at all. We don't do controversy here, right, Ken? <laughs> all right, we're out of time for today, so we'll see you back on Wednesday.